Okay, hello everyone. Uh, hopefully Rogue Link is also audible. Hello everybody. So I'm going to wait for some feedback from chat before I get started with the run. Um, I promise I haven't fooled you all. Uh, this is definitely for sure an RPG and it's not a, a side-scrolling platformer in disguise. It has an overworld and everything. Yeah, it even has random encounters, so it's totally an RPG. Yeah, yeah, it definitely has those. But yeah, so I'm Tina Hex. I run this game as well as many others, and doing commentary for me because he's such an awesome guy is Roguelink, who is the world record holder for this. Hello, everybody. All right, I'm hearing that we're both audible, which is definitely the way that I prefer things be. <laughs> All right, so I guess we should just go ahead and get started started in one second. So you can definitely tell that this is an RPG because it starts off with me mashing through text. Exactly. Uh, text mashing is a little important in this game. Mostly you want to mash B uh, whenever possible because A is what... Ha uh, opens your menu, similar to like Game Boy uh, uh, Dragon's Warrior remakes, where A opens your menu. So mostly you want to mash B just to prevent that extra menus. Uh, most of the menus you can mash A because you can confirm, but once you're done with the confirmation you can mash B. Uh, pretty straightforward going on here, mostly just going up walls, pretty, pretty clean, pretty clean cut. Uh, avoiding enemies. So as you can see, normal platformer, basic hover mechanics here. So you're going to see Tina floating in midair with that gauge in the lower right slowly going down. Uh, that's how long she can hover. And over the course of the game, she's going to be getting new attacks, uh, new jump height, more damage, all that stuff. It's also pretty important to note that the first two stages of this game are easily the most difficult. Uh, since you only have two health, uh, usually Tina would do a damage boost there, but since she took damage earlier, unfortunately, she couldn't go for that. Yeah, but so I go getting... for a strat uh, pretty early in the level that uh, I picked up from the tasks. And it's dangerous, but it saves like a second and a half when you get it in lag, so... Yeah, there's a couple ways to go through that stage, both of them reducing lag in different ways. But the first boss, pretty straightforward, just a mash fest. Uh, a lot, none of the bosses have iframes, so we can pretty much just go to town. And what an excellent time to talk about random encounters, and it's a good one. Um, there's actually a lot of little micro-optimizations uh, that we've developed over the last couple of years for how to do these encounters optimally. Uh, for instance, this one we actually changed relatively instantly to in recently to take damage on the first two instead of the last two. In the overworld, depending on where you are, roughly every four to eight steps, you have a 20% chance-ish to get a random encounter. Uh, getting one random encounter before this forced encounter is actually... Uh, actually not that bad at all. Hopefully she doesn't get any uh, until the first town, but we'll see. Yeah, so another thing worth pointing out here is that uh, Capcom was very, very generous with the iframes that they gave us, uh, which is great because it means that we were able to build strategies around standing right up in the enemy's faces as we, uh, as we mashed attack. Uh, additionally, the only cooldown on our attack is based on when the sprites for the attacks themselves uh, despawn, which is just one more reason to really get up close and personal with anything that we're going to be fighting. Right, so this is when they, this was before they realized that it's a good idea to have cooldowns even on basic attacks. Getting all the way to the bridge with only one encounter, that's, that's actually pretty good. Uh, this level, again, pretty straightforward. Uh, you have to be pretty careful. I can't remember if the fire spikes deal two damage. I think they do. They do. But the, 
the ground definitely does two damage. So there's basically nothing you can touch in this whole stage besides those spikes uh, that Tina jumped over there. Pretty good RNG so far. Yeah, making it all the way to the next forced encounter. Going for the double kill here, I assume. And oh. uh, I'm just going to assume Tina gets it. <laughs> oh, almost. Almost, yeah. It was close. It was really close. And I'm guessing a no in... Only one? Only one? Yeah, there you go. Nice. That's really good. So, having one encounter... I don't... I, I'm not sure if one encounter is world record pace, but it's, it's close. I believe world record has two encounters. And then almost none the rest of the run. So that's pretty crazy. Uh, here, Tina's gonna do a bunch of strats where she shoots and gets the bullet on screen before something spawns. Uh, playing it a little safe here with some back and forth. This fly right here is the worst fly in the entire freaking game. Um, yeah, that fly has uh, definitely uh, ruined a lot of runs. So rude. Uh, and here, what's going to happen is Tina's actually going to jump up in the air and head right in order to block that platform. Now, it's kind of confusing as to what happened there. But when you're in the air and those moving platforms hit the edge of the screen, it goes immediately to the other side. Again, here, just working our way through. There's a lot of tight jumps through here, and it doesn't look too stressful, but you have to remember that if Tina takes any damage here through this entire stage, she's not going to be able to get a quick kill on the boss. So it's very important that she takes no damage. Nice little setup here. So mashing for all of these, you're going to want to take damage on the second kill. Oh, looks like you're taking it pretty safe here. Oh, there you go. And let's see what the timing for this guy is. Yeah, there you go. Nice. Good fight. Yeah, that went pretty clean. Um... There was one spot where I thought that uh, that I was going to see a projectile that uh, the boss just decided to not give me, which I'm not going to complain about. Yeah, sometimes if you're fast enough the and you're just in the right spot, the boss will shoot an attack and it'll instantly despawn. Uh, here we're actually setting up for a death warp. So this is one of the big changes in routing uh, that happened within the last uh, year or so where we used to go down and avoid that forced random encounter before the tower, but now what we're actually going to do is get to Jark, and Jark's going to give us... Uh, Jark was the person that we talked to uh, initially in order to head to the tower, and we have the Gremlin Stick, which we need in order to restore Jark's power. See, there's a plot, totally an RPG. Um, <laughs> there we go, finally. And once we... Yeah, and once we talk to Jark, we're going to get a candle and you might think oh man why is tina dying this is terrible but again death warp so we actually want several encounters and she didn't take any deaths before the tower so we're actually gonna have to die three times yeah, uh three two times. now oh yes two two more times uh fortunately the bridge with us still at two health gives us a convenient instant kill right at the beginning so i Ideally, we lose all of our deaths on uh, random encounters to try to mitigate the random encounter a little bit. Also, only two random encounters up to this point is really good. So again, yeah, two damage. Definitely nothing kill. to complain about there. And once Tina dies here, she's actually going to warp back to the tower, which is going to put us really close to where we need to go and give her another two lives, which is going to allow her to uh, possibly die here, but I don't know if she's going to. Okay. No, not for that yeah, one. I'm not sure where that one's too quick. Yeah, I'm not sure. It's true. It's, it's a really quick one. Uh, you kind of want to save your deaths for the really long encounters. Uh, there's a double chariots and two ogre encounters that happen uh, on this stretch, which is really difficult to do any damage boosting on. Uh, here, Tina's actually getting the first health upgrade, so she's going to be at three health instead of two, 
which is going to be huge for certain encounters, specifically these sort of like merman things that do two damage to you. But the chariots and the giant ogres actually can do uh, three or more damage to you. So you really still have to avoid them or uh, save the deaths. Um, but speaking of using deaths, though, Tina's not going to use one here. Oh, there, there you go. That was the double kill. Or, uh, yeah, yeah, pretty sure that was the double kill. So speaking of deaths, uh, anytime you win a fight, you lose approximately 12 seconds no matter what happens. Ah, so here's going to be a nice damage boost. So this shot does two damage now that we have three health. It only does two of the three, so we're able to damage boost that and end the fight pretty quickly. Uh, Tina's also going to be heading up and grabbing this hidden item here. It's actually really obvious if you talk to the NPCs in the area that there's something hidden here. Um, but this is going to be the first wing strength upgrade, which is technically required in order to get over the next bridge. Uh, but well, there's the plot a... says it's required. It's true. The plot says it's required. Uh, the world record says otherwise. <laughs> But it's a it's 16 nearly frame perfect inputs in a row in order to get over this gap without the uh, wing strength upgrade, and it's about a 30 second time save. But for marathon safety, it's just better to get the the wing upgrade. Yeah. You can already notice that you know Tina's wing gauge is about twice as large as it was before. So it's really easy to make it over this gap now. Yeah, I think this gap is where a lot of casual playthroughs ended, though. Because you do still have to modulate your usage, and there's mm -hmm. nothing in the game to force you to learn that up until this point. Yeah, it's definitely something that, uh... It, it's kind of weird to do intuitively. I want to say I figured it out as a kid, but not after failing that jump, I'm sure, multiple times. Yeah. Let's see, I think this is three encounters for this split? It's yeah, this one was pretty bad. I mean, comparatively speaking. But three as a whole is probably below average, I'd say. Oh, I think average sure. is probably like five or six. Um, so here you're going to see Tina jumping over a lot of what looks like safe ground. You can kind of see it via the sprites loading and them being slightly awkward shapes. But there's going to be a lot of traps on the floor that Tina's actually jumping over here. Um, also, you kind of saw it there a second ago, the Brick Break, which is the ability that Tina also got from beating the second stage, allows us to... Um, break through those blocks, but only blocks that are that very, very specific shape. Tina going for the, the jump there. Always. Even it's the only strap. Little... It's true. It's, it's actually a pretty tight jump. Uh, it took me a while to get used to it. Even though it lags harder, overall, it does save time, which is pretty crazy. Uh, this boss is another just sit there and mash. Uh, during casual playthrough, you'd probably notice that this guy splits into four pieces, and then you have to kind of chase him down, though I believe he always spawns in the same spot. But For us, we just kind of sit there and go to town. Uh, Tina's damage is actually doubled, because you can have two brick breaks on the screen as opposed to just one. Uh, this is the, the king of the demon realm, I believe. Talking to uh, yes. him, I, yeah. It's there's so many dukes and kings in this game. I can't even remember who's who. <laughs> yeah, no. This is we we just cleared the king's palace of the invaders, and uh, thanks to that, the king is willing to let us uh, continue on to kill more invaders, as you do. Right, right. Getting another uh, big power upgrade, uh, jump upgrade, and a wing strength upgrade. Yeah, it's true. Uh, so, it's 
there there is definitely a lot of lag and lag management in this game. Um, but it's important to keep in mind that this was a very, very early game. Uh, Capcom did an amazing job with what they had available to them. Yeah, I think this game came out in 91 or 92. And one of the big advertising points is that it had scrolling in all four directions, which was almost unheard of. Like this, Gargoyles Quest had four directional scrolling before Mario did on the Game Boy. Because I believe this came out before, before like way before SML2, yeah. SML2, exactly. Now this is actually my, oh, 1990, there you go. Uh, thanks, chat. Um, so this is actually my favorite level in the game. Uh, the whole point is micromanaging your wing strength on the way down, and unfortunately Tina took damage here. Uh, this is another boss where you have to be at full health at the end. Unlike Monster Tower, though, there's one place where you can recover one heart, so there's a little bit more leeway. No, I wanted that heart. There we go. Uh-oh. <laughs> yeah, you, you definitely need that heart. Uh, what's the what's the frame window for killing this boss again? Eight frames? Uh, yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah, the the exact... task has like eight frames left of... Uh... Yeah, there's exactly... You, you have to kill him in exactly one damage boost cycle. Yeah. If you get the positioning right, you can just sit in one place and he'll either sit still or move back to the right. If your position is even slightly off, he'll leave you. And then it's just pure panic from here. But Tina did an excellent job handling that fight. And now we have the claw, which this game, the, the claw is actually in every Gargoyles quest game. And this is the, uh, you, this game easily has the most usage of it. Uh, not only is it another power increase, but it allows you to sort of neutralize spikes by shooting it against walls. Uh, in casual playthrough, you probably would have done this fight before the boss. Uh, this gets you another armor upgrade. But with the claw, we're just going to absolutely blow through this guy. I believe it only takes four or five hits. It's insane. And now that we've gotten the Candle of Darkness, uh, we're going to talk to this Duke or Baron or something like that and walk through the wall. And He's before the mayor. you ask. We're talking to the mayor. Yeah. Talk to the mayor. Yup. And before anyone in chat asks, no, that hole is not in the wall before you do that level. <laughs> Unfortunately. So we've reached the part of the run where the giant fish can appear. Uh, as you can see, there's random encounters, although Tina is doing a fantastic job with this lack, lack thereof. Um, only, I think you're at only four random encounters so far. Yeah, I'm doing pretty thing. okay, yeah. Um, and there's a small chance that the first boss shows up as a random encounter, which is hilarious because it can only take damage from your basic attack, which is not very clear as a ca from a from a casual player. No, it can take damage from uh, from block breaker as well. Oh, does it? Oh, yes. okay. So anything with a boss flag uh, just can't take damage from claw, basically. Oh, is that how it works? Yeah. I never actually realized that. <laughs> So now we get the uh, giant plot dump of the game. You basically find out from this guy that you are in fact the main character of clearly an RPG, and uh, only you can save the world, or the demon realm. But of course you're not strong enough, so you need to, you know, continue, progress, all that good stuff. And uh, this is the part where you absolutely obliterate chariots. Uh, this is the forced chariot encounter. 
and this is this is where you really start to become super powerful in terms of destroying random encounters. Uh, it's also where you start really feeling how long the victory fanfare lasts, because each random encounter you lose a minimum of 12 seconds without taking a death between the victory fanfare at the end and the reward screen after the random encounter. So even if you just uh, win the fight almost instantly, like you do at this part of the game, it still takes a little bit of time. And I believe Tina does have uh, a life to use if she happens to get uh, a random encounter. I did not know you could make that jump without taking damage. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I usually uh, damage boost back and just go for a clear jump. That's really cool. So we're really hoping for... Oh, okay, we got one. Fish! 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 Nope, no fish. Okay. I didn't want to spoil it. <laughs> Thanks. I was, I was so really hoping. The, yeah, that's the screen that the fish can show up on, and it's either fish or the, the plant uh, thing. Oh no, getting ruined by these random encounters. I'm guessing you're gonna save the uh, the lives for Rushevel just in yeah, case. Yeah, just just in case something goes wrong in Lucifer's castle. Fair enough. Yeah, the next boss is literally Lucifer in Japanese, but uh, Nintendo of America didn't really like that in translation, so they changed it to to Rushevel. When you really sound it out with a Japanese accent, though, is not actually that far off. Uh, this section's actually supposed to be a maze. There's a bunch of caves uh, that you're supposed to go to and sort of figure out which one it is. One of the NPCs telling you uh, the right one, but of course we know the right one to go through, and we're heading into the second to last level, where Rushfell basically calls you weak and wants to test you. So now we just head on in. Uh, this is easily, easily the hardest level of the game. <laughs> Yeah, I'd say that this is the most technical, with the, only the monster tower being close to it. Right. The With all the damage boosts, the last stage can get close, but the last stage has so many like more safety strats than, than you can count, so... This is the last one that's really, really tough, with some massive time loss. There we if go. You, Got it. If you die. So here, this is actually a really important setup. Uh, you can either take one damage from the spikes to the right, or two damage from the sort of drills on the left. Tina wants to take one damage there, and not take damage except for in very, very specific spots, in order to do a quick kill on the, on the boss. So health management is very, very important here. Uh, there's some backups. And it's possible to beat the boss without taking any damage, but it's uh, significantly Slow. slower by yeah, uh, it's a not couple fast. seconds. Yeah, it's a good safety strat to know, but it's definitely slower. Also, here Tina is jumping up this slope because for some reason walking up slopes is just really, really slow in this game. So let's see if she gets it here. Uh, she's basically going to be aiming for Rushafell's shoulder and then mashing in. Yep, there we go. That's a good setup. One more damage there. And yep, she's good. So yeah, this boss is an absolute nightmare to do casually with homing shots galore and just tons of stuff on screen. But the speedrun just totally cheeses it. It's fantastic. And now we are at our ultimate form. We have five health, infinite wing strength. All right. <laughs> able to leap buildings at a single bound. Let's it's go. pretty First crazy. First try, we're gonna get this. First try. So because we have infinite wing strength, we can do a pretty crazy trick here. We can actually fly under the stage because the only thing you need to do in order to beat this level 
is to go to the right side of the screen. It looks like Tina's having a little trouble here. Yep. Ooh. Gonna try one more time. I'm gonna go for one game over. Yeah, That's and the the respawn here is like right before this screen. Yeah, so, so it doesn't lose, lose that a... much time. Yeah. We're gonna um, we're gonna go really... ahead and just do it normally, which yeah, is a bummer. Okay. Yeah, that trick only saves half a second, but it's so cool when you uh, when you pull it off. There's actually kind of two ways to do it. There's one spot where you can fly over the level, and there's one spot where you can fly under the level. Uh, going over the level doesn't save any time, and going under the level saves, like, half a second <laughs> if you do it first try. Yeah. But it's always fun to do for marathons. All right, now it's time for the best BGM in the game. Oh yeah, this music is fantastic. So there's going to be a lot of technical stuff Tina does here between uh, swapping, like using Claw in order to get spikes and uh, keeping Brick Breaker. Now what you're supposed to do is swap back and forth between Brick Breaker and spikes uh, five or six times, but instead what we're going to do is save those menus because menus take a long time in this. Uh, I'm not sure how long it takes for each menu, but it takes a long time. Oh, an unfortunate damage boost going up there. Not um, a big deal, though. But, yeah, no big deal. Tina still has plenty of health to go through the, all the necessary damage boosts. So ideally, this should be the last time that she menus with going for that one uh, rift break. Let's see if let's see if she can get it. Interesting fly cycle there, cutting it pretty close. Still okay. Going up and over, there's going to be another damage boost here, where she takes one damage from spikes, instead of taking two damage from fire. That's literally the tightest vertical jump in the game, but, you know, no sweat for Tina. Literally free. <laughs> And we're going to have another damage boost here. Oh, wait, no. This one, you just jump straight up. And then there's a damage boost right before the end. And then we just got to dodge this gargoyle, and we're done. So, when I was talking about mashing B earlier, there's one prompt in the game that you can't accept. And it's this one right here. If Tina mashes A and hits yes... You actually fight the final boss with absolutely no powers, and you're forced to just die. So we say no, line up our shots with the final boss, and that's it. Well, that's a bummer. Uh-oh. Oh, boy. Backup strats time. No biggie. <laughs> Maybe biggie. You could drop your hands anytime. I'm going to take a death here. Yep. Ah, uh, that's unfortunate. But at Not the much. very least, the, uh, yeah, if you miss the, the lineup for the first tack, it's uh, kind of rough. But fortunately, like I said, Tina just spawns right here. And hopefully she lines up uh, with the head. Yeah, it was just a little bit, a little bit low that time. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty tight. Um, his hitbox is pretty big, but it's really easy to just drop a little bit too low. Um, you can actually save a couple frames by being over his head and then dropping down because there's less distance between the shots, but it's, it's not worth doing. Tina, of course, devastating the boss with the dark fire this time. And that's it. Uh, time is actually going to be coming up here soon. It's not going to be on this text prompt where Brager talks about you defeating him once again because Gargoyle's Quest 2 is a prequel. Spoilers. And uh, time is going to be when she finishes talking to uh, the king of the ghoul realm once again. And there we go. So, I'm... 2812, not, not too bad. Um... My PB is 2650, which is third place. So 2812 in a marathon setting without taking, you know, a bunch of aggressive intentional deaths during the uh, the fights is a pretty okay time. Yeah, that probably would have been a low 27 or a high 26 if uh, you didn't have the those deaths. Yeah. 
Yeah, for sure. Because I know, I know intimately well, because I lost a world record to it, that dying on the final boss loses you minimum 45 seconds. That's, that's not untrue. <laughs> But yeah, great run, Tina, and uh, thanks for having me on for commentary. Yeah, thanks for thanks for joining in for commentary. I really appreciate it. No problem. Let's see, who's coming up next? I think it's Holy Smith, but I'm not sure. I'm going to have to check the schedule. Yes, it is. It yes. is Holy Smith with Lunar. Hi. <laughs> Why, hello. Hi. Enjoy, the Enjoy the rest of the marathon, everybody. Yeah. So... Uh, are you got the, the stream? Okay.